Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by Field Effect and Colleges and Institutes Canada. Uh, and today we're looking at uh, developing cybersecurity programs that drive enrollment. So specifically, how can uh, your institution differentiate its cybersecurity programming from the rest? Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from Ottawa, which is on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. And your speaker today is Noel Murphy, who is Director of Simulation Technologies at Field Effect. And Noel has 20 years of experience in software development and IT, most recently as the Director of Product Technology for All Online Training at the SANS Institute. Noel has the ideal mix of IT security and e-learning backgrounds, giving him a unique understanding of not only the needs of cybersecurity professionals, but also the needs of people who train them. During his career, he has been a software developer, a, a software architect lead, and has managed uh, software development teams. So I just want to remind everyone there will be a Q&A period at the end after the presentation. So feel free to type your questions uh, in the chat if you have any, and Noel will do his best to answer as many as he can. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Noel. So hello, everyone. Let's start off by talking about you know the cybersecurity landscape as a whole. So. Everywhere you look today, there's an article talking about, you know, the growing cybersecurity skills gap. Um, so why is this happening? Well, cybersecurity used to be something that was, uh, you know, only governments or large financial institutions used to be worried about. Um, however, in today's landscape, cybersecurity is a growing concern for businesses of all sizes all around the globe. Um, large ones get discussed and printed about, but the reality is that they're happening all the time to businesses of all sizes. You don't have to go very far to uh, find a recent incident. The pipeline ransom was the largest, uh, most recent one that everyone knows about, but incidents do happen daily all across the globe and more often than people realize. Although laws have been put in place that are supposed to you know, force people to disclose when they have been hacked and have an incident, uh, not everyone does that disclosure and depending on the impact, they may not have to. The costs of these uh, attacks are big business. The Colonial Pipeline attack was a $5 million payout. The US government has supposedly retrieved some of that Bitcoin that was paid out, but it's still a very good payday for hacker groups all across the globe. A cyber attack can be detrimental to the businesses or an organization or the organizations, as well as those that rely on the services that those businesses are delivering. This means that the demand to have staff familiar with the threats and be able to mitigate against those threats and protect against those threats has increased. The Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity said that while cybersecurity workforce grew by 25% in 2020, there are still 3.5 million unfilled jobs worldwide. And here in Canada, the cybersecurity job market is growing by 7% annually. So how are we going to close that gap? Well, we need to in my opinion, place a strong focus on how we uh, and focusing on educating cybersecurity um, at the educational level. So in order to close that gap, we need more trained professionals. And to get more trained professionals, we need more students enrolling in cybersecurity programs. However, the current enrollment doesn't match the demand. And let's talk about why. So one is demographics play a large role in this industry. Cybersecurity is currently seen as a male-dominated field. This is changing, but not at a rate that is going to close the gap soon enough. There is also a perception that cybersecurity is only for the super smart or that it is highly complex. So I've participated in high school workshops. I actually have high school aged kids myself. I've had discussions with their friends while sitting around in the backyard. And you know, some of the comments I've heard them say is, I probably don't have enough math. I'm not smart enough. I don't know how to program. However, I, I know these, you know, a lot of these students from experience that they're actually some of the best ones at learning how to do problem solving or how they can break down a task and be methodical about how they solve a problem. Those are skills that are uh, great for anyone who is entering into a field of cybersecurity related career. We also need to do a better job of removing the barrier to entry. So often the less privileged don't have access to the resources that may be required to be successful in the program. So this is you know, an expensive laptop, software to be able to participate in the labs. If the labs are pushed down onto the students, you know, some of these underprivileged students may not have those opportunities. With the pandemic, this became even more of an issue because on-premise or on 
campus access to labs and hardware became impossible. So just as an example here, how do we overcome those barriers to enrollment? Well, the industry as a whole needs to do a better job of advertising and communicating roles and the different career paths that people can take in the cybersecurity field. Recently, Field Effect gave a talk for the Cyber Titan event uh, held by the Information and Communications Technology Council. Cyber Titan is their national uh, you know, security finals for all the different cyber teams across the country. Um, this year, they had 11 teams, uh, five members per team, and they all participated um, in, in an event that was a full day long. In day two of the event, they asked for guest speakers to come in and Field Effect was happy to participate. Um, we put together a panel and we, we chose to put four women that are employed here at Field Effect. And our goal was to showcase the different backgrounds that each of them had. And while two of the women did have a background in math and computer science, two of the, of the women also had a background in, in roles that were not traditionally thought of as a prerequisite to a career in cybersecurity. For instance, you know, Alyssa had a background in uh, criminology and Elena had a background in international relations. This just showcases the need for cybersecurity to be woven through all of the different curriculums, not just computer science and engineering. So how do we solve some of this low applicant challenge? To attract students to your program, you want to be seen as a leader in the field. This means getting awareness of your program out in front of students as they're making their decisions about their future career and what they may do post-secondary. The reality is that many high school teachers, however, even computer science teachers don't know where to start, which aspects of cybersecurity to start teaching, and how to thread that into their high school level curriculum. By creating materials and resources for high school level teachers that are free to use, you can get awareness of your program and interest early on. Create summer hackathons, uh, you know, create cybersecurity camps over the summer that will create awareness for the field, your program, and your institution as a whole. As an example, ICTC has actually had great success with this model by providing their Cyber Days program to teachers. The program gives teachers access to an online lab with walkthroughs and instructor guides, and the students get their first glimpse into the mind of a hacker and the steps to mitigate that attack. The student is presented a Windows workstation that is suspected of having malware on it. The students then work through very simple tasks such as use the logs to determine who was the last user that logged into this machine? Does that user normally log into this machine? How long was the user session? Does any of this seem suspicious? And the students, these questions seem very basic, but these are the types of tasks that, you know, open the minds of students. They get them thinking about cybersecurity and it plants that seed for their cybersecurity career. When students are making their decision, they also need to understand life after the graduation from your program. Cybersecurity has this aura of being cool um, you know, we've all, uh, it means be working for the government or the military. Uh, the possibilities advertised today are very much the NSA blue lit room with many computers and zero daylight. Um, all the industries uh, need cybersecurity. Maybe they want to be a mix of a cybersecurity and healthcare. There's a job for them. Uh, law and cybersecurity, there's definitely a career path for them too. When we talk about who's hiring, the answer needs to be everyone. Remove that government military only notion and emphasize how a career in cybersecurity can open many doors for them in the future. So we've talked about you know, how to attract students to your program. So let's talk about how we create a program that builds the next generation of security talent. So let's talk about what is the industry looking for? There are many stats out there that show there's a big shortage of cybersecurity professionals, but what is often missing is those statements that you know, what areas are those jobs actually in? So in cybersecurity, there is a great deal of overlap um, between the different roles. However, there is some unique skills that at the end of the day are unique to one role in cybersecurity versus another. For instance, somebody who is a day-to-day -day analyst might have a different set of skills that is than somebody who is working on compliance. Helping students choose those security roles when they graduate by providing those differentiating courses will help make them more successful in landing a role and then makes them faster to being effective for an employer. And that is what employers want. Whether you want to align your program to a specific role or just have a course that is specific to a role at the end of, towards the end of the program, there are definitely frameworks available to help you uh, identify those different roles and the skills required for that. The NICE framework is an example of this. Uh, it's published by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. 
and has many of the roles outlined for you, such as cyber defense analyst, uh, cyber incident responder, malware engineer, reverse engineer, et cetera. And for each of those roles, they uh, outline the set of skills and knowledge that a student must have or a person should have to be competent in that role. And they've even broken it down to what does a beginner role look like? What should an intermediate person be able to achieve? And what should an advanced person be able to achieve? This is the type of uh, hands-on keyboard, effective on day one type of uh, candidate that employers are looking for today. So theory alone doesn't cut it in the real world. Um, there's a shortage of trained professionals and that idea that um, a junior person is going to have the ability to spend some time being mentored or uh, uh, learn on the job from a senior person, uh, that, that, that does, doesn't exist. There isn't enough senior trained staff to go around to mentor these junior people. Not many organizations even have a team that's big enough to uh, be able to have both senior and junior people on the, on the uh, staff. Oftentimes these organizations are hiring their very first cybersecurity person and they can't uh, invest in a junior person who may make a mistake and have end up being one of those costly outcomes. So for this reason, the training in your program absolutely needs to have a very hands-on component. I can't stress this enough. This is what I hear time and time again, both from what when we are looking for candidates for hiring ourselves here at Field Effect, but also for any of our clients and our partners. The pen and paper exercises or the multiple choice questions, the theory-based questions that you do um, just don't quite it, cut it. So two expressions that I always like to use is, you know, you can't buy experience on Amazon and, and you can't learn to ride a bike by reading a book. Um, that absolutely holds true in the cybersecurity field. The needs for hands-on uh, exercises and labs is vital to your, organ your program being successful and for your graduates being uh, successful in the workforce as well. Also, um, you know, gamification is a way that the industry uses to teach certain topics. It's kind of been a, a way that people are using to try to teach cybersecurity. And our opinion is that cybersecurity isn't a game. And that's the same for all the telcos that we deal with, all of the different customers and partners that we have. Um, you know, the, the gaming, it's okay to understand a very high level concept for somebody who isn't in the cybersecurity field. But when it comes to actually being a cybersecurity operator or someone who um, is in that field day to day protecting your data, the labs and education need to reflect the real world. Um, everyone here probably has a driver's license uh, and you can drive a car safely, but you know, no one would get in a car as a passenger with somebody who learned how to drive on their Xbox. It just, it, it's, it's that sort of mentality that, that extends into the workplace. Organizations feel the same way with their networks and their data. So keep it real and leave the games for at home. Um, to address this hands-on realism, you need a lab or a lab environment that simulates real office production environment. Uh, you can create this using traditional lab hardware. There are platforms out there that will help you create these hands-on environments. Um, and these are commonly referred to as a cyber range, whether it's a collection of hardware or computers set up, but that is where you would go to do, you know, deploy your malware and be able to do those interesting things that you would never want to do in a production or internet connected uh, lab environment. By using this range, you can create realistic environments and uh, then layer in uh, objectives or labs for the students to learn from. There's some advantages to using a cyber range. So by using dynamic content. So this is one that I, uh, I hear stressed a lot um, is you know, having the content being different for me versus the student next to me versus the student next to them. If everybody has the exact same labs that they're working through, um, and I get the answer first, you know, I can tell the person to the seat next to me and then they haven't really completed the lab or learned anything. Another advantage that you wanna have is you wanna be able to uh, have every student experience the uh, lab at their own pace and not be um, all fighting for the same uh, servers and whatnot in the lab. So for instance, if you have a class of 30 people, you don't want a situation where the first person who completes the lab and, you know, is able to power off remotely power off a server and the other 29 students are like well that was maybe fun um, you want each student to be able to experience the lab to completion on their own so that they get the full learning experience 
The, uh, so what these labs provide is that dynamic content. Um, you want to be able to uh, ensure all the students are completing the tasks. So in other words, having the ability to monitor, did the student get to the right answer or did they just you know, not even bother attempting the, the, uh, the exercise? The students get that, the hands-on lab time that employers demand. The employers get recruits that they know how to, that know how to do the job versus just having the theoretical knowledge of what they would maybe do. Uh, teachers and professors can ensure that you know students aren't being answered and that students are actually completing the tasks. And the platform, oftentimes, um, depending on how you design it, can do the scoring and reporting for you. So you can actually get that indication that you know uh, student A was able to complete all thirty tasks, but student B was only on fifteen before the time ran out. And because of this, this automated scoring system, you can also potentially use this for a practical hands-on exam. This is something that I hear again and again, instructors, or sorry, not instructors, industry asking for is when they interview candidates, they make them do a hands-on keyboard exercise to prove that you know, the words on the resume actually reflect their abilities. So during the, I actually started talking about this. So during interviews, we often ask, we at Field Effect often ask new grads to perform a certain task. And the answer, uh, if they have one, usually goes something like this. Well, we did that during one lab, one time. I think we used this tool to do it. And I eventually, I think I got to the correct answer. And, and oftentimes we follow up with, okay, how many times did you do that? Um, you know, could you do it again right now if we gave you that same lab? And the answer is usually, we did it once and no, we fumbled our way through it. Um, we oftentimes we spent, again, the, as the student's perspective, they spent too much time setting up the lab um, and getting all the environment the way that they needed to be able to execute the lab, following those instructions before they could actually get hands on keyboard and do the lab. Um, I recall I was in a robotics uh, course way back in my university day. Um, obviously, I couldn't take the robot home, I had to do it while I was in the classroom and I are in the lab environment, and I spent the full three hours just trying to get the, the robot and the computer to communicate versus I never even got a chance to talk to uh, actually make the robot pick up the ball and throw it across the room like what the lab was intended for me to do. Um, that sort of frustration and is, is common, and you want to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, reduce the amount of troubleshooting time and frustration of your students and augment or increase the amount of time they spend actually learning and achieving the task. So you want to be able to also make it repeatable. So students, um, oftentimes, like they do something once, they can't explain what they did or they don't retain it. By having it something that they can do it again and again, they're going to retain it and have a lasting memory. But again, you have to make it dynamic so that the, the solution is not uh, the same every single time. By making it dynamic, it keeps them engaged, and it also makes them realize that sometimes the solution the first time through doesn't scale to the generic case. So by having them do it multiple times, they can learn what is the best way to do this that will work in every case. The more times the students go through the lab, the better they'll do in the interview process, the more competent they feel, and the more successful they'll be in the real world. So I've talked a lot about um, the, this complexity and mimicking the real world. Um, so what I want to talk about here is so all this creating hands-on, realistic, experiential learning, uh, that sounds daunting. However, you know, this really shouldn't deter anyone from taking on this task. So yes, the labs, they can be hard to author. Creating networks that simulate the real world and dynamic content is different for each and every student. It's no small feat. Um, labs are also complex for students. Um, I mentioned my robotics case. I'm sure, uh, you know, there's also chemistry cases where I remember, again, going and getting uh, trying to get a chemistry lab set up and get it working. And it just, I spent the entire time um, getting the equipment and the materials that I needed to do the experiment and very little time actually doing the experiment itself. However, the real world lab, they're, they're, sorry, the real world is also very complex. You can't skimp out on this. Employers or future employers know this, the industry knows this, and they don't have the time to train the junior staff. There, however, there are software solutions that make this easier on everyone. Students will learn way more. They'll get the hands-on keyboard exposure that they need, and they can get to doing their learning right away versus troubleshooting a broken lab. Often these platforms also allow the students to self-serve. So this allows the students to be able to go in and redo the lab as many as they want. Some students will want to do it once. Some students will do it 10 times. It's really up to the students and how, they, how much they want to lean in and do those labs. 
This also allows oftentimes the platforms to be able to revert back to a starting state so that you know you as the instructor or the lab administrator, you don't, there's nothing for you to do. The students just go in, they say they want to start a new lab, and the environment resets itself back to the starting state again. Lastly, I, I stress that in terms of this complexity, you should really you know, leverage existing content. There's lots of resources out there on the web that can be used as your lab component to maybe bootstrap your program. So, uh, you know, if you can focus on the lectures and the theory material, you can lean on the, the uh, open market or the, uh, you know, the, the industry or your community to collaborate with them and come up with labs that can be shared across the industry. So, I just want to touch on, you know, the last 18 months has taught us anything. Um, is that being able to learn remotely is absolutely a requirement. Um, there's been, there, have, there is perceived light at the end of the tunnel. I, I have, uh, you know, I'm scheduled for my second shot uh, next weekend, actually. But it's not a given that in-person lecture or on-premise labs are ever going to go back to the way they were. So being able to deliver online is crucial. Um, the good news is that unlike the physical classroom, there is no seat limitation in an online setting. Um, there is also no lim limitation for who can attend your program. Students can now attend programs that are delivered in different cities from where they live, even different countries. However, all of this online learning means that experiential learning must also be brought into the student's home. So having a platform or, uh, that can provide access to the cybersecurity lab for the purposes of everything that I've spoken about before about that experiential learning is going to be crucial. Students may or may not have expensive hardware either, but most have a browser and a decent internet connection. A platform where students can self-serve any time of day is ideal. Students have a different schedule um, than the instructors or academic uh, uh, staff. You know, uh, lots of times students are up at 2 a.m. working on assignments and homework. Um, but uh, oftentimes the uh, staff is at home in their beds. Having that environment where that remote learning is an absolute must um, and keeping the experience uh, is, is, is crucial. So that actually is the end of my presentation. Um, I'm Matt, you want to host the Q&A? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Noel. I guess we can move into some questions. The first one being, uh, you, you know, in the in the cybersecurity space, what types of roles are businesses looking to fill? Cybersecurity analysts, for sure, is the biggest role. Someone who can come in and help understand what it is that the what does my network look like? What is on my network? What are the different uh, you know devices that might be ex uh, that might be the the entry point to a, uh, an infiltration of my data. Uh, but the reality is, is that because uh, cybersecurity, a lot of organizations, especially here in Canada, aren't large enough to have a devoted cybersecurity staff, but they know they have a risk of a cybersecurity breach. They often need like a system administrator that has had some cybersecurity training as well. So this is where you, I stress that you need to thread cybersecurity through all the different roles and all the different curriculums um, within your program and your institution, definitely the computer science uh, cyber needs a course needs courses on cyber secure programming and active uh, application development, secure application development, as well as the cloud is becoming a uh, a new uh, a new a big field that everybody wants to get into, as well as mobile. So mobile security, cloud security, application development, um, system administrators, but then you even get into there's jobs in law. Um, you know, there's a lot of breaches that are going on. Cybersecurity law from a law perspective or a legal perspective is becoming a big um, uh, growing field as well. Great. Thanks for that. Um, there's one question here is asking if you can show the last slide again. So maybe we can just leave that there while we answer some more questions and, and let whoever asked that question um, review the slide. Um, so the next question is, what hardware would you need to initially set, uh, sorry, excuse me, what hard, hardware would we need initially to set up a cybersecurity lab? Excellent question. So it really depends on budget. Um, we use, uh, you know, you could stitch together a whole bunch of uh, old computers. I, I've seen uh, a cyber range created with a whole bunch of leftover computers um, that would traditionally be desktops. 
But the reality is, is you would want to have, it's going to be a significant investment. It's going to be a low, but low six figure investment to really stand up if you want it to be something that is used across multiple curriculums um, or multi, many, many students with no um, uh, limitation really to be able to do your whole campus. You're going to be looking at a low six figure investment. However, um, oftentimes you can get away with a simple, you know, $20,000 ESX VMware system um, that students can then connect into that they can provision their own environment and, and uh, go from there. It really depends on how you uh, architect your labs as well. So I mentioned um, the idea that every single student wants to have their own environment. So if you create your labs and you have, you know, 20 VMs per student, that's quite a bit different than if you just have a simple, you know, log analysis course that has a Windows VM that has, uh, you know, days and days of logs accumulated in it. And every student gets one copy of that Windows VM. That is a, a wildly difference in terms of hardware. So um, oftentimes when I'm engaging with a client, we kind of talk about, we scope out exactly that question. How many students are going to anticipate being in the system concurrently? Um, and how large do you anticipate your virtual machines or your environments being built? Um, the other awesome thing about these is that they can grow with you. So you can start small and just add more hardware as your program becomes successful. You don't have to do that six-figure investment up front. You can absolutely um, you know, just start small with one program. Maybe it's one, one course, one lab. Um, and then, you know, in the following semester, you add more and more to it. There's, there's, it can grow with you. You don't have to do the entire build upfront and, and put a lot of upfront capital into it. Uh, so the next one is, where would you suggest focusing students studies for a two-year program that provides a, dip, uh, excuse me, a diploma credential? Right. So this is where I would suggest that in a, the two-year program, you you focus on one of those roles that are identified by NIST. So take the mapping of the of the you know the NIST roles and the what is the industry looking for. The one that always for me floats to the top is the cyber defense analyst. Um, that seems to be the one that is in the most demand for a two year uh, program. The and NIST literally lays it all out for you. Like these are the skills that they should have. This is what they should be able to do. This is the uh, you know and and the entry level and the intermediate level. Um, the what I would say is that um, you know what I have heard and I, and this is not field effect. This is Noel speaking. Um, I've heard a lot of anecdotes that you know aim for the frameworks, not necessarily make your program aligned to a certification. Um, there's a lot of certifications that um, you know have a lot of marketing dollars behind them. Um, and they don't necessarily always result in somebody who can do the job. So the, the NIST has speak, taken a lot of uh, time to put that work, those work roles together and what skills are required uh, for that. I would mention too, there's a Canadian equivalent. Um, the Canadian Cybersecurity Center has put out a work roles um, equivalent to the NICE framework. They have their own framework. They overlap like 90%. There is a small variance here and there, um, but they, there is a Canadian equivalent as well. So the next question we have here is, so what generally is the cost of the cyber range and how is it structured by hour, by semester, uh, by class, by year, subscription-based, et cetera? Gotcha. So if you're talking about um, our product, <laughs> the field effect does have a cyber range product. Um, I, there's actually a promotion that we're going to be doing for all the people who have registered for this uh, event here. So stay tuned, that'll come out next week. Um, but to answer the question, it really depends on the different um, vendors and how they license it. So for instance, we at Field Effect have the ability to do on-premise installations as well as we can host it for you. If we're hosting it for you, it's compute time uh, that you use for the student. So there's a fixed price for number of v your number of VMs that you've spun up at any given time. Um, we, we typically don't... Um, uh, we have a limit on the number of students that you can have in any, any given time, but it is based on, you know, how much usage you're using. If you want to host it on your own hardware, um, we have a different pricing model for that as well, where you play, pay a, a flat fee for number of concurrent users that you would have. So you could have 10 concurrent users, thousand users in the system, but only 10 concurrent users on it at any given time. 
Um, some of our competitors are on-premise only. They would be more in that model of concurrent usage. Some of our competitors are cloud only, and they would be on just straight up usage. Um, and, and it can go both ways. Uh, oh, this I really like this question because I think it's really um, it, it's really important for our members. Um, so how can a cyber range be used by an educational institution as a competitive advantage when recruiting students? Gotcha. So, um, so a couple different ways. So back to that idea of like um, a hackathon. So I, I like the idea of getting the students interested and, you know, like I experienced this thing that was put on by institution X. Um, that makes me really understand, like they know what they're talking about. They were able to put together that event. I was able to participate. That seemed cool. I had fun. That was engaging. I'm going to go to put my dollars behind that institution. So for me, I would say a cyber range allows you to host those events, be it a capture the flag or, you know, you do um, any sort of type of event where at your recruiting fair, it's like, hey, you want to take one of these labs? This is what you will experience when you come to our institution, right? And they just, you could literally have a, a link that they click in their browser. You want to try it now? It spins it up and they can play with it. That's the type of experience that another institution that doesn't have that cyber range, that click and go kind of um, ability, you're, it's all pen and paper. The students are just reading, like, what do they see? Uh, you know, sometimes students can get, there's fancy videos and whatnot that can maybe lure people in, but being able to say, this is what you will experience when you arrive at our campus, to me, that, that, that sells it. Is a cyber range a more cost-effective solution than traditional student training platforms? That's a great question. And um, I'm not, when you say student training platforms, so that I, I'm not really 100% sure what traditional training platforms would be. So often I've seen it done different ways. You have a lab environment in school where you've bought all the computers and they're just sitting there and the students go and use them. Obviously there's equipment that's backing those. It's the same equipment that would be used for a cyber range. So in terms of the cost of that equipment, it's the same. Where you get an advantage to potentially using a cyber range or something that can be accessed only through a browser is now you get the idea that um, it can be automatically uh, provisioned as needed on demand. So the first 10 students through the door get access. The 11th one has to wait potentially if there's not enough hardware um, or they can access it from home. So the other one is students um, in some traditional labs, you get a USB key with all the VMs on it. You plug it into your machine and you have to host it or run it on your own machine. Um, back to that idea of the underprivileged or the people who don't have access to resources that you are now opening the door to those people who couldn't do it before because you've offloaded all the compute back to your servers at your institution versus having the students trying to fumble to get it set up on their local host, local VM, local machine, sorry. Okay, great, thanks. Um, now, this is a good question too. So, because we know we all uh, are looking for, um, you know, micro-credential type programs these days, really quick training to respond to labor market needs. So this question is, um, you know, in a six month program or less, can you provide, uh, sorry, sort of identify the fundamental topics that should be included in a program? Right. So when I think of a six month program, I think of like, you know, a crash course on Windows system administration or Linux administration. And there's definitely, you know, just add, this is where a lot of system administrators, they know how to do, you know, domain controllers, add up accounts, uh, connect machines, maintain a network. Adding a cybersecurity element to that makes the, all that candidate that much more employable and that much more desirable by the industry. Um, it, there's a lot of uh, places out there that are currently forcing, like I said, we do a field effect where we uh, we get a resume, we get a candidate we like, we sit them down at the keyboard and say, show us that you can do this. That's becoming more and more the norm. Um, you know, hacker rank is an example of that where employers are forcing um, uh, uh, candidates to go through that. You want to be able to um, prove that when they go into those interviews that they have some cybersecurity knowledge as well. So for me, that, I think answers that is if you already have a six month program, you're just trying to bolt on or weave the cybersecurity concepts throughout the uh, curriculum to make sure that they have that understanding that, you know, it isn't just system administration and there's a security aspect to it as well. Great. And I, so there's a, another question. Um, I think you may have touched on it a bit before, but so how are employers currently selecting their hires? 
oftentimes they are, um, you know, they put out their resume, they get, when we put out a job posting, we easily get, you know, hundred resumes in the first 24 hours. Um, and oftentimes, you know, they're looking for, obviously experience floats to the top because, um, you know, somebody who's actually done the job has got way more experience than the person who's coming out of university today. And that's that gap that I think we're trying to close here is to make it such that the university students do have the experience and do have that hands-on keyboard. They've seen it before and not just one time. So what a lot of uh, our, our partners, what we're, we're hearing from them is that they are using tools like HackerRank or Field Effect has developed some, um, some assessments where the student, they get a link in their inbox or the candidate gets a link in their inbox. They have three hours to complete the assessment and the uh, partner gets a score to say, you know, hey, this person uh, knows their stuff. They got an 82%. What's even, uh, another thing that a lot of uh, employers are doing is they issue either one assessment that carpet bombs a whole bunch of different topics and it helps them identify well, this person I applied for this role might not be a great fit there, but they actually really ace some other categories or some other parts of this assessment. And we know we actually need a role filled over there so we can go and hire them. So the hands-on keyboard assessment is becoming more and more uh, uh, a mandatory uh, interview process. Great. And, and you know, similar, a similar question here. Um, so is there, an expect, is there an expectation from future employers that students and recent graduates uh, will have experience training uh, on a cyber range? So I, I think it's just they, that they have some experience and that they can do um, some simple beginner level, entry level tasks. Obviously coming out of university, no employers expect them to be um, uh, you know, a rock star on day one, but, and it doesn't have to be on a cyber range. So it's how you deliver that experience or how the student gets that hands-on training is vital. Um, but how, or sorry, how they do it is kind of irrelevant. It's just, can they do the task? Um, whether again, they went through something like uh, hacker rank or a cyber range, or they just loaded up the VMs locally on their machine. It is just crucial that they have that hands-on keyboard experience. A cyber range just makes the experience easier for everyone involved. Looking towards the future uh, of sort of the cybersecurity industry and employment, are there any interesting trends that you've seen or can you share any insights into what we expect in the future? For sure. So cybersecurity, um, uh, right from the tippy top, right from the government, you can see more and more funding is being trickled down into cybersecurity programs. Uh, Canada uh, has woken up and said, you know, hey, there's a lot of other countries that are investing a lot in their cybersecurity um, education system and their cybersecurity industry, um, and we're going to do the same. So those dollars are still kind of like at the programs where they're kind of working their way down, but there is definitely uh, massive amounts of funding opportunities out there that can, and grants available to be able to start up and uh, uh, start your cybersecurity program. Great. Um, we don't have any more questions right now, Noel. So I think you've done a great job uh, covering all the topics that people wanted to wanted to hear and explore today. Um, hey, thank so, you. Yeah, with that, I mean, do you have any closing comments that you want to share? Thanks for attending. Um, if you have any more questions for me, um, I'm always very engaging. Uh, I love the questions. So it's at letschat at fieldeffect.com, which is the email address that the uh, recording will come from. And as well, um, I hinted at it, there is a special promotion that we will be doing. Um, you probably should hit your inbox either tomorrow or early next week um, that will outline some details that we're doing uh, for all of the uh, uh, people who attended this webinar today. Great. Well, thanks for that, Noel. And thank you to uh, all of our participants. And I guess we can close up there. All right. Thanks, thanks Matt. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thanks, everyone.